come tonight uh, to hear Sheriff Tom Dart. We'd like to invite you to have tea and some snacks. And the um, Muslim Advisory Board to the Sheriff just wants to welcome you and ask you to have some tea while you wait. And he'll be here shortly to speak with us. The Muslim Advisory Council, we just wanted to explain a little bit about what it is that we do. We are Muslims living here in Cook County who are um, of different professions and we essentially put together this task force in order to be a liaison with the Muslim community here in Cook County as well as the Sheriff's Office. There's obviously a need for certain services that um, uh, the Sheriff's Office could act and provide in a more efficient manner um, to our community. So. We'd like to welcome everybody for that opportunity and for being here. So before we begin, we do have some very honored guests here and we thank you for coming. And we'll have them say a few words before the sheriff does get here and then we'll commence with our program. So let me just first start by um, introducing, we don't, all our panel members are not here yet, but let me just start by introducing a few of our panel members. Um, we have Abder uh, Goulet and Dr. Uh, Sima Imam. And why don't we just start, uh, and as well as Salman Aftab. So, Abdur, if you want to just start by explaining a little bit of some of the projects that we've been involved with uh, as part of our advisory council. Uh, Salaam Alaikum. Thank you, Saada, for the introduction. Um, the, the Muslim Advisory Council was started by the uh, Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart as an outreach program where his uh, staff and sheriffs and deputies uh, interact with our community. And um, some, of, some of the efforts that we've started is um, sensitive, sensitivity training video that is uh, currently in production. And um, maybe one of the other board members will go into detail on that um, awesome uh, video that they're putting together um, in training their staff and their officers in, in dealing with our community and the sensitivities um, that go in, go in, in, in detail with that. Um, some, of the, some of the other activities was um, a review of how the courthouse, the courthouses in Cook County are run and the interactions between uh, Muslim visitors and uh, the courthouse, um, in particular having uh, signs in where we're attempting to put signs in different languages to assist people who English is a second language, just to direct them to the proper uh, locations in the courthouse. Um, instructions on how to get an interpreter if needed in the courtroom. Also coordinating with the chief judge's office. Um, on the interpreter services, also that there's courthouse uh, babysitting services available to uh, people who, who don't have a babysitter and they need to attend court. Um, also, um, sheriff deputies in the courtroom ha have been um, instructed and trained on how to deal with uh, Muslim visitors. Um, and we, we started um, one tour of the Bridgeview Courthouse where we're, we're doing the pilot program and we plan to go to other courthouses in Cook County, um, especially the ones where the um, majority of our community members attend or, or need to uh, interact with. The courthouse uh, is not just um, where there are judges and trials going on, there's many other um, county services that are in, in the court build, courthouse building. Um, you have the Cook County Clerk's Office, treasurers, um, pretty much lo many of the Cook County um, branches of, of uh, government have offices in the courthouses. And on a daily basis, our community needs to go there and interact with the different agencies. So uh, the uh, Sheriff Dart's um, staff has been very good in introducing us to many of the other agencies at, in the Cook County and um, trying to um, brainstorm ideas on how to better service our community. Uh, many of them already started uh, pamphlets and brochures in Arabic and um, we're going to also um, mention um, and, um, 
you know, encourage them to, to soon have them in Urdu. So that, that was one of the things that uh, we've been doing, and there's been other um, outreach activities where, where the sheriff's office comes out to the, to the community and uh, comes to our events. So I would just like to thank um, all the other board members who've been uh, putting in effort for the community um, with, with the sheriff's office, and, and mostly uh, Salman Aftab, who has been the, the, the main um, organizer and hardworking person in putting on many of these initiatives together. And I would like to introduce Salman um, Aftab to discuss with you some other things and introduce some more guests. Two of our distinguished guests um, have some other plans this evening, so I would request State Senator Ira Silverstein to say a few words. Uh, State Senator is such a good friend of our community for such a long time, and uh, we are very grateful whenever we have any event. He is so gracious, you know, to come here, and we're really thankful. So give him a big hand, State Senator Ira Silverstein. Thank you, Salman, and uh, thank you for bringing this, and I want to thank the task force for also coming out here. I think it's important that all nationalities and cultures meet with elected officials to bring their concerns and their issues. Um, on a personal note, I, I'm in Springfield. I, uh, I think you, we've got one of the best sheriffs that served this office since I was a young man. Um, I know Sheriff Tom Dart for a number of years. We served together in Illinois General Assembly, and I know he's going to be attentive to a lot of the issues that you have. But I want to, again, I want to thank Salman again and the task force. It's very important that you reach out not only to Sheriff Dart, to everyone in, a, in the public arena to make sure that your concerns, your needs are adequately met. So again, we have another event, but thank you very much for bringing, bringing this to uh, everyone's attention. Thank you. And now I will request the wonderful alderman of 50th Ward, the ward you are sitting right now. Um, she's a new alderman in this ward for the last three years, but she has done so much for this ward that the pre I, I have no, um, I mean, I'm going to say it openly that last 20, 25 years, what I have seen in this ward is not comparable what she, is, she has done in the last three years. Uh, please give her a big hand, alderwoman Deborah Silverstein. Thank you, Salman, for those very nice words. And there's more to come. So we're, we've got a lot of things, good things planned here for the 50th Ward. Uh, I did want to just touch on a couple of things um, since we're here tonight with the sheriff that I just wanted to inform you of. Uh, crime to me and keeping our neighborhood safe is a top, top priority for me. We meet together with the commander of the 24th District twice a month with the business owners on Devon. And I was fortunate enough to organize the first um, multi-jurisdictional sting with Sheriff Tom Dart and the Chicago Police Department in the city of Chicago. Uh, this happened a few weeks ago where we had uh, about 60 officers from the Sheriff's Office join the commander of the 24th District and his officers working on um, getting our gang members under control and out of the 50th Ward. We paid visits to those people that are on parole. We arrested people for solicitation of prostitution. We had uh, officers uh, going up and down to the businesses to make sure that people were not selling illegal cigarettes and alcohol. It was a major, major sting. It was very, very successful. And I'm already talking with Sheriff Dart about coming back and doing it again. So um, this neighborhood is extremely important to me and uh, we have a wonderful 50th ward, one of the most diverse wards in the city of Chicago, one that I'm very, very proud to represent, and one that I look forward to working with you to making it even bigger and better. Thank you so much. Um, we'll also have, um, we've been instrumental in having, to make sure that especially in the wave of, unfortunately, a lot of these hate crimes that we're having across the nation, that our masjids that we all attend be safe and secure. And we have the chief uh, sh uh, uh, agent from the office, uh, sheriff's office who was in charge of that patrol, Commander Parks. If you could come up, please. Good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Um, 
as I sit and listen to everything that's going on, and the biggest thing is about dialogue. You know, I'm hearing there's great dialogue between uh, the Cook County Sheriff's Office and and your community. And Chef Dark came to me in October, and he wanted to start a program where our patrol cars did checks at the mosque on Friday on your days of prayer. And he sent me a map, and I looked at the map, and I was, I was like, wow, a lot of these mosques are in uh, Chicago. And our patrols are pretty suburban, pretty much suburban Cook County. And the sheriff told me, let's make it happen. And we did that. And we've, we've had no in incidents up to this date. Uh, every Friday, we're checking, driving around, um, make, making a record of our visits to the mosque. And everything's been great. And I don't want to talk too much. I know the sheriff is on his way, and I don't want to step on anything he might want to say. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, our department is just willing to help. And I think in helping, we just need to have dialogue. I think that's the biggest thing. And I see that's happening. And I see with everybody here, that's been happening. So I thank you for having me. Have a good evening. There were, there were two law enforcement issues that we addressed um, with Cook County Sheriff's Department. Um, in addition to the security patrols, um, after there were a few incidents in Morton Grove and um, in, in the western suburbs, and an incident out south where there was some vandalism or um, otherwise some other uh, attacks on the, on the mosque, um, fortunately there was no injuries, but um, Sheriff Dark came to us and said, what, what can his department do? And he initiated um, the patrols that the commander is uh, following up on, where they will go and do patrols at all the, all the mosques in Cook County. And we're um, very thankful for that effort. Um, you know, the, the security of our community is going to be at the utmost um, for our council. Um, the other law enforcement issue was one lo very uh, local. Uh, down the street here on Devon, there was um, an increase in crime. And we brought this up with the Cook County's uh, Sheriff's Office, and I'm from the South Side, so I, don't, I wasn't really uh, familiar with the issue. But uh, Sal Salman Aftab, who is one of your community here, um, knew, knew in particular details on how the effect of crime uh, how it's affecting our community here on Devon and the increase of uh, gang activity and um, I guess they brought some drug dealing and other things that um, was um, uh, really um, bad news to this community and something that we are not used to. So um, they, uh, they initiated uh, more patrols and uh, a small task force, uh, some undercover police, and they made a number of arrests and really um, have helped in bringing down, in, uh, supplementing the Chicago Police Department in bringing down a lot of the crime and cleaning up some of these uh, corners that we have here on Devon. So um, we're very thankful for the Sheriff's Office. Um, I would like to mention some names here, some of the representatives of the mosque, different mosques here in um, greater Chicago area, Cook County. Um, I will start um, from my left hand side, Mr. Ahmed Jangra representing the uh, Al Huda Masjid, Schomburg, Dr. Inam Hussain representing Ikna Center in Chicago. Um, we have um, Makbul Khan, where is he? I don't see him. Makbul Khan representing Jama Masjid, the largest mosque in Chicago area. Rafiq Talati from Makki Masjid, where is Rafiq? Okay, Rafiq Talati from Makki Masjid. Muhammad Haq from President of uh, Jama Masjid. Um, and then we have Ghulam Faruqi, Mr. Ghulam Faruqi. <coughs> always open our doors for, uh, of Islamic Center of Displays whenever we needed any event and we don't have any place else to go, then we knock his door and he's always so gracious. And then we have um, 
not official representative of MCC and MEC, but principal of MEC who will speak to you in a few minutes, uh, Habib Qadri. Uh, now I will ask our favorite alderman, I mean, I couldn't say that when Deborah was sitting here, <laughs> but I mean, there is no doubt that out of these 50 aldermen in the city of Chicago, he is the most outspoken alderman and we love him all, even though he's not from this area, but we gave him honor, honorary citizenship of Middle East, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, you name it. I will proudly present to you, ladies and gentlemen, our favorite alderman, Joe Moore. It is, as always, great to be here. Uh, as Salman Aftab, my good friend, said, um, I'm not officially the alderman of the 50th Ward, that is Alderman Silverstein's prerogative, uh, but I've always felt myself to be the honorary alderman of the Muslim community, of the Indo-Pak community. And I'm proud of that. You know, I think we found out something last week. We found out that the politics of division, the politics of hatred, is a losing proposition. The, those that sought to demonize immigrants, those that sought to sow uh, the, the fears of hatred, they lost. They lost, and our country won. Now that's not to say that we don't have a lot more work to do. And that's not to say that in our, in our steps toward progress that we won't have a few steps backwards from time to time. That's just the way it is. But, but we are moving forward. We are continuing to move forward. And the leaders of this community have been a big part of that. Folks that have demonstrated through their hard work, through their family values, through their good old-fashioned American tradition of, of self-improvement have demonstrated what a great benefit to our nation that the immigrant community is and particularly the Indo-Pak and Afghan community is to our great nation. And it's really my honor to represent one of the most diverse communities because I know firsthand that, that uh, I know firsthand the benefits that diversity and celebration of cultural differences brings, what, how enriching it is, and ultimately how economically empowering it is. That's the thing that doesn't get across enough, that immigrants contribute so much more to the vibrancy and the economic health of our nation and of our city and of our community than, than they at all ever, ever take away. You know that. And I know that, and I'm proud to announce that to everybody, no matter what crowd I speak in front of. And so uh, I want to just say uh, a few words, because I, I do have another commitment in, in back in my ward. I may be the alderman of the Muslim community, but I'm also the alderman of the 49th ward. i got to take bit care of business back home. Uh, but Sheriff Dart is really a, a tremendous, tremendous leader. He's far more than just the county sheriff. He is a leader that understands, as I indicated, that we need to work together, that, there, that uh, we need to embrace our diversity, that we need to reach out to communities to increase understanding. The great work he's done in the courthouses to help make the courts and the judicial system more accessible to people, less mysterious, less, less scary. Um, that is, that's wonderful because what makes our country so great is that we try to aspire to equal justice for all. And how can you have equal justice for all if people don't even ha understand how that justice system works? That people are intimidated by that justice system because they don't hear their language being spoken. They don't see... Uh, uh, instructions that they can read and understand, that they have people who, through no fault of their own, because they're not trained properly, don't understand the customs. That's where misunderstanding takes place. That's where, that's where uh, 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 conflict takes place. But the more that we make efforts 
to understand our cultural differences and our practices, and, and in so doing, understands that there's, we understand that there's so much more that we have in common that divides us. It's the kind of leadership that Sheriff Dart has, ex has exhibited through forming the Muslim Advisory Task Force, through putting in rules and, and procedures that make it more user, make the court system and the judicial system more user friendly. Uh, I can't tell you how lucky we are in this county to have someone of his leadership and of his vision and of his sensitivity. So thank you, <laughs> Sheriff Dart, for, um, for being here, for, for fighting the traffic to come up to the far north side of the city to honor uh, this community and all communities with your, with your presence and with your commitment to making um, justice for all, not just a slogan, but a reality. Thank you very much, and thank you, Solomon, for having me here. And the task force. I'd like to start with the universal greetings of uh, our salutations of Muslims. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be on to you. Again, it's a great pleasure and an opportunity for us to have uh, a distinguished guest. For just in the last 45 to an hour, you have heard many individuals, when you're not even here, say good things about an individual. So, and as, as Muslims, we know that God has always had people who bring people together, who unite people together. And it's, it's a pleasure to have an individual, an individual where, who had the opportunity to run one of the finest sheriff departments, and had the opportunity to also help our community. As you might know, some inf information about him, which were on the flyer, Tom Dart was elected Cook County Sheriff in 2006 after previously serving as a state prosecutor and state legislator, so he's worked up the ranks. But one of the things that many people, you might think, oh, he's just a local, and as, just as the alderman said, he's a national figure. When you have Time Magazine named Sheriff Dart one of the most 100 most influential people in the world, there's something going up. So, so I've always seen him on TV, and I got a picture here, and everyone's like, well, this is a handsome looking guy. So, but, uh, but it's great to finally get to meet him. I've got to meet many of his associates and people who work for you, being part of the advisory committee, and also having a situation happen in our community of a, of, a, of, a, of a shooting. And then the next day, another incident at another Islamic school where, uh, of a pipe bomb. Then you'll see that when, that's when you sometimes don't know what you got until something happens. And this is something, it was a, it's a pleasure to have individuals who are in the law enforcement, especially from the Cook County Sheriff Department, who step in and help out and see what they, what they could do. And I've seen the rounds that they've done on Fridays to make sure if everything in our community is fine and many of the other Muslim communities, which is quite vast in the Cook County. Inshallah, so with that, without further ado, I ask that we give a big round of applause to Sheriff Tom Dark. Hey, thank you so much. You know, with the uh, very, very kind words that were said uh, about me, usually a person who's got uh, a functioning brain will just come up here and say thank you and sit down uh, because I'll just do nothing but serve to disappoint. Uh, but just truly, you know, I know Deborah was here. Was Ira here as well? Yeah. yeah I mean, they're phenomenal. I served down in Springfield with... Uh, Ira, when I was uh, sentenced to 11 years down in our state capitol, and he did just amazing job. Deborah's doing a phenomenal job. But uh, Joe, I mean, Joe's an amazing alderman. I'm sure all of you know he fights the real fights. Joe has no problem, never has, standing up to whoever needs to be stood up to, which is somewhat unique in this business. So I've always had just unbelievable respect for Joe. And Judge Haddad, all I can say is if they were more like you in the judiciary, I would probably be working two-hour days. Um, he really is. This, this, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. I, I tell this to anybody who listens. You, you're like the standard. If people were as committed and passionate as you, these, so many of these issues would go away. I wouldn't be sitting there pulling my hair out trying to wonder why we can't get this done or that done. You're someone who believes in what you're doing, and it's just it's the truth. I would tell this to any crowd, and I tell them about you because it's just the truth. So amazing person, amazing job. Please don't retire. Um, <laughs> we need you around. Um, I uh, Thank you so much for putting this together. Advisory committee, thank you for pulling this up. Thank you, everybody, for subjecting yourself to a South Sider. I'm always amazed that people let me get north of Madison Avenue. 
especially being a hardcore White Sox fan like I am. Yeah, yeah hey, come on. Hey. Yeah, yeah. We didn't lose 101 games this year, guys. At least we didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, wait till next year. Yeah, I've heard that once or twice. The, uh, what, what I was going uh, to attempt as best I can to do tonight is to lay out just some, some broad definitions of what our office is, because it, it is somewhat of a mystery to a lot of people, exactly all the different things that we do, how we overlap with the Chicago Police Department, other police departments, all that. I was going to sort of lay that out, um, mention a couple of things that we have done internally in our office, and then you know open it up for questions from there. So just as a starting principle, the, the, our office, Sheriff's Office, we have about 8,000 employees. Uh, we have, when people think of us more often, they think about uh, the jail because we're in charge of it. Our jail is unique in the sense it's the largest in the country. Uh, it's nothing you know, you're proud of that you have the most incarcerated people in the country in your jail, but it's just what the realities are. Uh, I, today, in my population, I had about 12,500 people that were in my custody. About 1,500 of them are on electronic monitoring. It's a program that is run in tandem with the judiciary where they will put people out as opposed to sitting in a jail cell. They have bracelets on their legs that allow them to stay in their house uh, as opposed to being in the jail, which obviously the jail is a much more expensive proposition. The jail costs us just under $150 a day per person, um, whereas in, when they're at home, it costs us about $20. So there is definitely a move to try to get the nonviolent people out. It's something that is being done more of. But it's really one of the primary responsibilities of our office is the jail. Within the jail, we have tried to be very sensitive to everybody's needs, no matter where you come from and whatever your issues are. So we work with individuals who want to receive whatever services they have. So we, we have Muslim services within the jail, we hand out Korans to people who wish to have them. Uh, we have halal food for individuals who wish to have that as well. So within the jail, we, we try to make sure we meet different people's needs as we operate a very difficult jail. As you can imagine, just when preparing food, we prepare over 30,000 meals a day. And you can imagine it's very difficult to get all the meals to the right people, make sure temperatures are right, all the rest of it. It's very complicated. So. You know, are there screw-ups? Yes, screw-ups do occur, but they're somewhat minimized. Uh, within the jail, we've been trying to come up with all sorts of outrageously different programs to try to deal with the numbers at the jail, to try to come up with strategies to keep people from coming into the jail anymore. Um, we're having some luck with it. We run a really large farming program now to teach detainees how to farm, how to raise things. Uh, it keeps them busy, gives them a bit of a skill. We then take the produce and we sell it. Uh, to restaurants. Uh, we're in high demand from restaurants, believe it or not. Charlie Trotter used to buy his stuff from us. Um, and m much of the high other, other high-end ones get their things from us. Then we go with the rest of it to farmer's markets to try to make money. We have actually beehives that we brought in this past year at the jail, so we make honey to sell as well. We have fish farms out there, so we're trying to be creative. We're trying to be creative in teaching people skills, some things they can do when they get out, have some type of plan. Uh, it's uh, particularly challenging because the number of people are at the jail is difficult, but the other point that a lot of people don't fully appreciate, it, because of a lot of decisions that have been made in government in regard to funding different programs, specifically as applies to people with mental illness, uh, the people with mental illness have not evaporated when the programs evaporate, they end up in the jail. And so my population on any given day is about uh, 2,000 to 3,000 people uh, who are there with serious mental illness, receiving psychotropic medication. Uh, it's very difficult. Obviously, it's very challenging on us, but it's also, I think most people would agree, not the best way to treat people who their primary reason for being there is because of mental illness, not necessarily because they're criminals. So it, it's a, quite a challenge for us. We've been trying to develop some strategies to put some of them into appropriate nursing home-like settings and things like that. So. It, it, when it comes to the jail, it's, it's a very difficult area, but we have been excelling at it and been getting a lot of uh, credit throughout the country right now how we've been doing it. So that's the largest part of the function of the sheriff's office. We also, though, are the ones that do all of the service process. So when you have lawsuits and someone's suing somebody, 
we're the ones that knock on the door and give them the lawsuit. It keeps us very busy. It's something that takes a lot of our time. We've gotten more efficient with that as well by utilizing uh, segways and things like that downtown that we never used to do. So we're getting there. The other really big area with that we're involved with is we do all the evictions. And so when it's time to evict people, we're the ones that do all of that. We, four or five years ago, completely transformed how that is done. In the appropriate cases where there is issues dealing with children, uh, seniors and the like, we go out quite a bit ahead of time to try to work with them to get them into a better setting, try to make it so that an event that by its nature is a very traumatic event is as least traumatic as possible. It's something where we have some thought put into it uh, with the seniors. A lot of the seniors we deal with have issues with dementia and the like. So we're trying to get them into programs. Um, the city of Chicago has been fantastic. The Department of Aging and working with us on that. Try to get them out. People have children trying to get transportation to help them out. But in doing the same thing, as far as for the landlords, we've become much more efficient than we ever were before and making sure that individuals who are being played by individuals who know the system only too well, that we are very prompt and professional in how we move people out and that the landlords can bank on the fact that we will do it in a professional way, a timely way. We don't treat you like we're the cable company where we get around to it, we get around to it, we get people precise times and dates. And so much more professional operation there. So that's the second largest part of the office. The third largest part is our police department. And I, I should have mentioned up front, I have numerous people from our office here tonight, both from our police department, but from some other aspects of the office. So that at any point, if anybody has questions after you're talking to me, I have quite a few people from the office here who would be happy to answer questions, both from our patrol division, from our investigations division, uh, dealing with gang issues. We, we got people here so that can help you. But, that, that area, the police department, uh, is the one that is uh, more difficult for some people to understand because for folks who live in the city of Chicago, they think of the police, they think of the Chicago Police Department. They do a phenomenal job. What we are is, within my office, I have jurisdiction over everything in the county. Because of resources, manpower, the rest of it, the different towns and villages have their own police departments. They're the primary source of law enforcement within that town. But I overlap and I sort of go where I want, when I want, which I like to think is directed by needs. And so specifically when after Solomon and myself had talked, there were specific issues brought up about Devon Avenue. Uh, so we just brought some people in and did some work in here that were directed by you know, individuals, constituents who had concerns about it. We do that. We do that throughout the city of Chicago. We do that a lot in suburban Cook County. That area of our police department is about 600 people in that range of police officers. We operate a lot in suburban Cook County. With all the budget issues that have been going on throughout the country, the suburban towns and villages have been so somewhat under the radar screen in that their budgets have been decimated. And as a result of that, usually the most expensive item on any of their budgets is their police and fire. So they have been surgically cutting back all sorts of things that they do we end up picking those up and doing it. So our role keeps expanding and expanding throughout suburban Cook County. And it was within that, when we put our heads together with the advisory group, that we determined that there were certain needs that our office could uniquely fill. And one of them was working with the MOS and making sure that there was a more thoughtful approach in sort of patrolling, adding another safety net there too. So after sitting down with people from the advisory group, we sort of mapped out where all the mosques were at and we've woven them into some of our patrol districts so that we now go by on a regular basis, no uh, regularity as such on purpose so that people don't know when we're there um, so that we can add another layer of uh, pro protection for people, to be quite honest with you. So we do a lot in our police department. It would take me hours to go through it, but we do a lot of work in the patrol area, do a lot of work in the gang area, narcotics, we have a child um, exploitation unit that tries to go after individuals who are trying to get young children on the internet. Uh, we have a ch uh, child trafficking unit that goes after people that are trafficking children, trafficking women um, as well. So we're very, very aggressive in that area um, in addition to just the obvious things we do as far as working on homicides and the like. And as I mentioned, because of the 
critical issues in a lot of these towns, we're picking up a lot of other towns, um, homicides and things like that to help them with because they don't have the ability to do that. Um, I mentioned one of the other thing I want to mention just before I open up for questions was the advisory group, um, I cannot mention uh, and state strongly enough how helpful they've been to me. Uh, they've been incredibly sincere, earnest people who've given up their own time to meet with me. The one thing that I told them from the beginning is, uh, having been in the legislature, the quickest way to really not do anything is to put together a task force or an advisory group. And then when the real issues come up, you can sit there and you feel like you've covered it and you don't have to worry about getting hit because you can say, oh my, I have a task force on that advisory group. Most of them never meet. Most of them never have anything that they could put their finger on saying that they've accomplished. We, right from the beginning, talked in no uncertain terms that the only reason that I was interested in this because this was going to be a working group that came up with real solutions, real questions and concerns that we were going to come up with uh, solutions to. And so, uh, once again, on their own time, they spent a great deal of time working with me to make sure that our policies within our office really were as sensitive as I wanted them to be. So we started off with things such as the Bridgeview Courthouse, where we have a lot of people from the Muslim community that come in and out of there. To actually, Abner and some other folks went out there and I said, just walk through it. Let me know what you think. How is it that we can make this so that you feel that we've got everything nailed down here and dealing with people in an appropriate, sensitive way? And it was such an asset to me because I had individuals who were going to be able to look at something without a controversy stewing about, but just because we're concerned in walking through it to make sure this is done the right way. So we're sensitive to all the different issues that well-meaning people in my office might not have been aware of. And so they spent a great deal of time like that. We worked on other issues that were ones that might not have been as pressing as that, but were ones that were nonetheless very important for us to do. And so between working on that working on, they said, trying to provide some level of uh, connection with folks, the, 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 the group, the advisory group has just been fantastic. When issues come to the surface, we address them, we, we go after them right away. We don't wait until there's a newspaper story or a TV story saying something bad's happened. It's like, no, let's put them all on the table and let's walk through all of them here. So I, I can't thank them enough because it just really made me have a much higher confidence level, confidence level that our office is very sensitive to the Muslim community's issues and needs and that we are proactively addressing them and we're not just waiting for something bad to happen. So I cannot thank them enough. I can't thank you for having me out here today and letting me talk about some of the issues here. Um, and I'd be happy to answer everyone's questions. Um, we have several questions related to, uh, to gang violence. And kind of underlying this question is how can Muslim uh, clergy help overall with the jail system and with the gang violence. However, kind of specifically, what can the average citizen do other than elect new officials? I mean, sometimes we feel so, you know, uh, kind of alienated. There's a criminal justice system and we're not sure that the, you know, prosecution of gangs is going right. You know, we want to make sure that law enforcement is going right. And, and sometimes it's the, I, I hope I get this right, because it's a really important question. It's the law rather than you know, treating criminals as victims. Sometimes it's underprivileged roots that we're really talking about, but they wind up criminals. And yeah. so they fall into the gang system. Yeah, you know, you know. I think so much of it is dependent on some of the philosophies behind it. In our office, we have tried to, tried to we're, we're, we're close. We've started elements of it to have our gang units being steered by a intelligence-based system where based on data coming in on gang activity in the jail we we listen to all the phone calls we are very active in the jail we get incredible intelligence from the jail we roll out that together to try to pinpoint with the limited resources out there the real bad players the real bad people to try to target them and to try to go after them in a surgical type of way because the notion that you're going to somehow, whether you're talking about gang issues or drug <coughs> issues for that matter, that you're going to arrest your way out of it, it just doesn't work that way. And so it, it needs to have the combination of community involvement, both in communities, frankly, coming forward and saying, here are the problem areas, here maybe even are some of the problem people, uh, but also then demanding that you have that other step in there too, which is the preventative part of it, 
that says, let's go to the schools and let's talk to these kids about the real deal. And we do a program in the jail, and I, it's not like scared straight because that hadn't been shown to really work real well, but we do more of like an informative one. When it has somewhat of the net effect because you end up talking with people that are in the jail who are not some five-headed monster. There's some guy that is 22 years old who actually did well in high school and he ended up here and there. And so it has a good effect on the, the young people that do see it. So we, we, we're trying to do that in a pretty coherent way. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if communities do not feel that they're getting the proper type of attention, they really need to rattle people's cages because I, I just, I tell you. Speak up is the biggest challenge. So. Well, it is. And see, the problem is, is that I know only too well. Springfield was like a different planet. Most people had no idea who their state representative or state legislator was. And so as a result of that, they were so disconnected in their passing laws, we're passing laws, whatever it is, left and right, and no one really knew any different. So there was some immunity. When people are actually holding people accountable, saying, what are you doing? What is it that you're doing to address this issue? You get real answers. And the one thing that I learned a long time ago, uh, a lot of politicians, not all of them, but a lot of them, their primary motive is to get reelected. And so if you bring that into question, because you're saying, listen, we thoroughly disagree with your efforts. We thoroughly disagree with your lack of concern about this. So as a result of it, we are going to vote you out of office. It's a very, very effective method. Um, I'm going to read a question. We discussed the training video that is in production. And I forgot the question, to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, well, well, the question is, uh, maybe you could talk about the approach. Because the question is, can you show the training movie to different Muslim community and get the feedback to make it more practical. Now, you actually involved the community in this, and and, and, and the follow-up was, I hope it's not like the training video used by NYPD, FBI, and others where they got people outside the community to tell them how to deal with yeah. us. I know. And if you can that's why you know how you did your approach differently. Yeah, and there, it was so interesting because for me, that's why, once again, I cannot thank the advisory committee enough. You folks did so much work. You did like all of it. I was basically just left to sign my name to different things. At the heart of it, though, with the video, I wanted you to develop the video, not me, because I. the whole point of it was to get the input from the community, not for me to tell the community what you need and here's how it goes, but the opposite. And in the end of the day, I feel the video is really good. It was developed completely in concert with the committee, the advisory group, and if somebody has suggestions how to tweak it and turn it, you know, no one claims to be perfect around this place. I'd be happy to do that. So anybody who wants to view it, please do it. But it was really uh, sincerely driven by the notion that we want everybody. We want people to be very aware of where our office stands and here's what the criminal justice system is about, here's how we view it, uh, and really to have it really straightforward. So. Once again, if there is any change that people want, we're always willing to go back to the um, studio, which is my conference room, uh, to redo elements of it. Uh, but we feel pretty good because it wasn't driven by us. We were sort of in the back seat. We were letting the, the committee really drive this one. Okay, and just one last question, uh, Sheriff Dart. And I have several questions here, and it's just about uh, community safety and patrolling, people concerned about you know, being in their neighborhood after dark. But um, I guess maybe this question just sort of sums it up. Uh, how, are, how is the police force deployed? How, how is that determination made? Is it less crime areas get more patrol, therefore that's why they're less crime? Or is the inverse true? How, how you know, is that decided? You know, um, it, it, truly, I, I say this, the Chicago Police Department does a phenomenal job. And they have so many different issues than we have in our office. What we, we have our beat structure like the Chicago Police Department has their beat structure. I wouldn't begin to try to explain how they devise their beat structures and how they deploy it. It's just not, I wouldn't know, I'm not in their meetings and the like. Our beat structures are uh, really more or less driven by a lot of geographical issues because, uh, and trust me, I'm not pretending to say, oh, this is so horrifically efficient, it's not. Our primary job in my patrol division is to patrol unincorporated Cook County. So do I slide out of there frequently and try to help in other areas where we perceive that there's a problem? Yeah, we do. And that's where, like with the mosque uh, 
plan and uh, strategy we have. That's sort of what I'm doing. I've taken my cars out of their normal beat to go by Moss and to stop in and see if everything's okay. But the normal beats are so difficult for us because we have all of our patrol cars are one person cars and our beats are so elongated because of the fact that what we'll have uh, a trailer park here, we'll have two houses here, we'll have a county public housing here, then we'll have another block of 20 houses here, and that will be all in one beat. So you're left with trying to cover this vast area, usually with one or two patrol cars where the individuals are by themselves. And as they're going around the patrol, they're usually crossing over other jurisdictional lines through other towns and villages. And then if one of those towns or villages is having a problem, we then have to divert people to there. So ours is much less compact than Chicago's because of the nature of it. But what we have attempted to do, and I think we've had some success with it, is to try to make sure we have that balance so that the people in unincorporated Cook County are getting their service, but then to find these other areas where there's specific problems going on and sort of expand our beats a little bit to make it a more of a presence. And that's why with working with your committee, it's been particularly helpful because when, I'll be honest with you, when there's been some issues brought about Devon where people have said, Chicago's doing a great job, but we could just use a little bit more, we will come in here and we'll either add patrols or we'll do some gang activity up here or vice activity. So ours is a little bit more driven by, I'm not saying that anybody that calls us up on the phone, but people of substance, you know, such as yourselves, who have legitimate concerns that are of a larger nature, we will try to make things work in our area to be responsive. And in general, I think uh, we have been that, when specific areas have been pointed out to us, we've been very aggressive and talking with and working with Chicago then to supplement what they're doing, uh, slide our own vice operations in, our own narcotics operations, our own gang unit too. So ours is a little bit different. Um, so it's, ours is a little trickier. Thank you so much, um, Sheriff Tom Dart. I want to thank uh, the Muslim Advisory Council members.